My name is Jason Wallace. I'm the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church here in the Salt Lake Valley, and we welcome you to another installment of The Ancient Paths. It is our great privilege to have with us this evening Mr. Alan Roberts. He is the author of Salamander. It is the story of Mark Hoffman and the murders that took place here in Salt Lake City. And Mr. Roberts, very good to have you with us. Thank you. Now, I want to flesh these out, things out over the next hour, but can you give us just a, a nutshell version of what your book, Salamander, is about? It's one of the several books that were written on this story. The murders occurred in 1985. Mark Hoffman used pipe bombs to kill two people. Uh, Kathy Sheets was the first one in the morning, and uh, Steve Christensen in the afternoon. And these bombs, we believe, were used as a decoy to uh, cover up and, and delay accountability for a document deal he had done with the LDS Church in which uh, he had received a large sum of money as an advance payment. And f uh, in return, he was supposed to produce the McClellan collection, uh, and he really didn't produce it. And they demanded the collection of the money back, and so there was a lot of pressure on him. And so those murders occurred, and then he was um, um, injured by his own pipe bomb, uh, which we believe was intended for Brent Ashworth, a document dealer living in Provo. So this book documents uh, his background, his career as a forger, uh, really a world-class forger. It deals in depth with the documents and his relationship with the LDS Church. Uh, it deals with the Sheets family and Christensen's. Uh, as well as the church historians and the FBI lab and various victims. Uh, he was really kind of an equal opportunity con man. He, he left a, a trail of many, many victims. And uh, it's, it's a fairly comprehensive book. Uh, it's well reviewed. It, it was actually a bestseller for about a year uh, in the Intermountain States and was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize as well. So it's, it's been a fairly highly regarded uh, piece of work. I've heard very, very uh, great reviews on the book uh, from, from a number of different directions, people um, from outside the LDS Church and, and some that are still within the church as well. I'm curious, let's go back, who is Mark Hoffman? Well, Mark was born in 1954 and uh, the same year as Steve Christensen, actually. And he grew up in a very strict Mormon family, his father Bill. Uh, was himself the son of a, of a German convert, a, a man who was an architect, uh, one leg, he uh, was injured in World War I. And, and uh, according to Mark's partners, who, whom uh, I interviewed extensively, uh, he came to uh, be unhappy about the strictness of his upbringing and the, his, the inability to ask questions about religion. And one of his uh, partners, Brent Metcalf, said he became an atheist around age 13. But he stayed active in the church and went on a mission. And during his mission, even was collecting materials that he sent back to Utah and uh, started his forgery career in the uh, mid-1970s. Uh, was doing research up at the University of Utah, Western Americana, at the same time Steve Christensen was doing research, both of them interested in Mormon history, but one on the dark side and one on the lighter side. Uh, so. Um, he went through this long legal, legal procedure, uh, was plea bargained out such that he didn't, uh, it wasn't a capital crime, even though it was a premeditated murder or two of them, and ended up uh, <clears throat> getting a life sentence with no possibility of parole. And he had a wife and children, uh, attended his local ward, went to a local high school. Uh, he was sort of a chameleon uh, of a man. In a sense, he became for whomever he was dealing with, the, that kind of person that they needed him to be. So he was very uh, orthodox with pr President Hinckley, uh, President Kimball. He, he was buddies with the Tanners. Uh, he was, you know, good friends and cohorts of various document dealers and historians and authenticators. And so he, he really could uh, disguise his duplicity and his fraudulent activities. Some people who may not be aware of the specifics of this story, uh, if they've seen the, the show Law and Order, they actually based one of their episodes on his life, didn't they? I don't know that. And okay. I watch Law and Order, so okay. I'm surprised. But there have been uh, documentaries based on Hoffman, I mean directly dealing with Hoffman, 
and uh, other other uh, things have come out of his story. I, I remember the the episode, The Saint. I believe <clears throat> they they entitled it uh, included Stephen Colbert in in his role hmm. uh, before he became famous on Comedy Central and such. But uh, they changed the religion to Roman Catholicism, but they showed how as a child he had learned to fake mint marks on coins and then moved on to for forgery. That, that's much what happened in, in Hoffman's life, isn't it? I did research on criminal behavior. I read about five books on uh, uh, sociopaths, psychopaths, and one of the books had two checklists, one for uh, sociopathic behavior in children, uh, and one in adults, and if you applied those lists to Hoffman, he, you could check most of the boxes on both lists. As a child, he was interested in, uh, he, he did cruelty to animals, uh, he uh, lied about things. He would take bottles of old coins and bury them in the neighborhood and then pretend to find them and be the hero of, of his you know, group of kids. And uh, he um, was interested in incendiary devices, and that played out later in the bombs. So, uh, I think that that it's true. And you mentioned uh, Roman Catholicism, Law and Order. He read uh, a book by Irving Wallace called The Word, which was about a Catholic uh, prisoner who ended up forging uh, ancient documents that were discovered and declared authentic and changed uh, religious history. Uh, the, the book of uh, James, the brother of Jesus, and uh, the book of Petronius, who was uh, one of the guard, Roman guards at the uh, crucifixion of Jesus, and, and wrote these books as a way of getting back at the Catholic Church. And then murders uh, came about after, afterwards to the fighting over these documents and control of them and the content and the meaning of those documents. Now, before he started moving into the, the LDS side of things, he was actually making money selling uh, forgeries of, of, of other non-LDS authors as well, wasn't he? Well, he, he did forgeries of uh, Mormon things pretty early on, oh, really? and then he did American forgeries. Jack London, uh, Betsy Ross, he found a document that was made in 1837, signed Betsy, and he added the word Ross, and then changed the seven to a three, so it read 1830. That was one of his forgeries. Uh, uh, other American uh, heroic figures were uh, part of his forgery career. And then, of course, his big forgery, the one that would have made him a lot of money and probably uh, had he been paid uh, for these, would have uh, uh, avoided the, the murders, was Oath of a Free Man. And he made two copies of those. And uh, this was supposed to be a broadside printed in the 1600s as, as the first printed document in America. And he was going to sell one to uh, I think it was the Smithsonian and maybe one to the Antiquarian Society, and high prices. One was priced at a million and a half dollars. And uh, he supposedly found these in a bookstore back, back east, and they matched the description. No known ones existed, and uh, he found descriptions of them. And uh, so that was an American document. And we believe that his intent, besides making money, and he did make a lot of money with these forgeries, uh, and he would often pay to uh, split the cost of authentication, which gave him credibility. And he had leapfrogged ahead of the art of forgery detection for a while, got, got ahead. In fact, several of his forgeries were actually sold to America's two leading forgery detectors, uh, Kenneth Rendell and Charles Hamilton. Between them, I think they bought a half a million dollars of his forgeries, thinking they were authentic. So he was really good at it. Um, I think he was trying to change Mormon history or the perception of it and cast a negative light on uh, Joseph Smith and who he was and some of the other uh, sacred elements of Mormonism. And I think he was, to some extent, probably going to change American history, too. And had he not been caught, he may have succeeded at that. Now, before we get to the actual Salamander letter, which gives the, the, to the title of the book, what, what kind of forgeries did he do early on? And did they have much of an impact in terms of, of redefining Mormon history in the same way the Salamander Letter would? No. He started out with, with forgeries that were, uh, content-wise, very timid. They, they weren't controversial. And I think he was experimenting with handwriting and with research and getting the paper right and the ink right and the postmarks and all, all of the technical aspects. And he, he donated some of them to the church and got some credibility that way. And they were not threatening initially. And then over time, the documents would have just little 
word, a word, couple of words or a sentence or two zingers. And so the whole document would be fairly orthodox or fairly uh, traditional and, and then something uh, about money digging or a salamander ap appearing instead of Moroni, something like that. And so increasingly the documents became uh, controversial and uh, played to the paranoia of church leaders who then wanted to buy these documents and put them in the uh, First Presidency's vault and, and keep them away from the Mormon public so that their faith wouldn't be challenged by these documents, which the church leaders believe were authentic. And so did other people who invested in them. Uh, really nobody seriously questioned the authenticity of his documents. The Tanners had some, some doubts, but they were fairly uh, vague and uh, they, they didn't directly accuse Hoffman of, of forgery really. So the documents became more bold and uh, uh, threatening as, as his career evolved. So the Salamander letter, a lot of people have heard of it, but don't really know what the contents were other than it makes some reference to a salamander. What exactly was the letter? It was actually a letter purported to be uh, from Martin Harris, one of the early church leaders, to W. 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 Phelps, another uh, high-ranking church person. And it described uh, Joseph Smith's uh, discovery of the Book of Mormon plates, not in the traditional uh, story sense of the angel Moroni coming, but instead there was a white salamander and uh, there, were, there were some references to trickery and ench enchantments and so forth. So it, it really turned the, the whole traditional story on its head. And uh, it had probably some, uh, in fact, Hoffman himself admitted he got some of the ideas from uh, E.D. Howe's uh, Mormonism Unveiled, which was an anti-Mormon track back in the 1880s. And because it was authenticated, uh, it, it therefore brought into question Joseph Smith's uh, story of the genesis of the Book of Mormon and, and by implication the first vision story and the stories about John the Baptist and, and all the other foundational stories. Uh, if the salamander was what, what he claimed to really have seen then, then what can we believe about the others? So I think this was a very seriously threatening document. The, the mentions of um, money digging and, and sort of occultic type practices that, that, are, that are mentioned with the salamander and uh, uh, a reference to his brother Alvin and things like this, uh, this fed into the research that was becoming well known in a lot of circles within the LDS community, didn't it? Yes, well I would say well known within the historical community but not within the general public of the church. But true, Joseph Smith was a treasure hunter. He did use uh, white magic, uh, stones and hats, propitiations of chickens and, and, and chants and other, other things. Uh, 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 he had a business really trying to find buried treasure and one of the key documents that Hoffman created was the Josiah Stoll letter or money digging letter. Uh, so Hoffman really wasn't making this up. He was bringing to light something that I think church leaders would rather have seen stayed buried. Um, so um, uh, he did a lot of research and one of our major discoveries was uh, trying to, you know, we tried to figure out how did, where did he get this information because people like Leonard Arrington, the church historian and other historians, uh, believe the documents were authentic too, not only uh, from a technical point of view, paper, ink, and so forth, but the handwriting uh, for the most part and the content, and they didn't really challenge the documents based on, uh, on content. Arrington uh, believed that six of the documents were authentic even after they had been shown to be forgeries by Throckmorton and Flynn, the, uh, the document examiners who, who found the alligatoring of the ink. Uh, he was so persuaded by the content and that's because Hoffman did a lot of deep research. Well, we we uh, figured out that he may have gone up to the U and done this research and we went up and found the call slips that uh, he signed to uh, check out material and we found where he got some of the material like for the Joseph Smith the Third Blessing, uh, the Book of Mormon Grand and Printing Company contract and some of those documents. But more importantly we found that he signed some of the call slips Mark Hansen or Mike Hansen, uh, M.H. Mike Hansen, Mark Hoffman, M.H. And so he was trying to hide his, his research uh, trail 
even back in the mid-70s, a full year before the bombings occurred, and he used the same Mike Hansen name to buy the bomb parts that uh, ended up in the deaths of two people. And so we provided that information to the police in return for which they shared information with us, and that helped in our work, too. The, the stories that we hear from some of the contemporaries, uh, such as the, the affidavits that were taken in New York, uh, back in the, the 19th century. Uh, I think Signature Books actually put out a book, uh, Joseph Smith's New York Reputation Reexamined. Uh, they describe some of these same things, don't they, in terms of during the, the money digging years, um, Joseph's neighbor claimed that they took his black sheep and, and ritually killed it to supposedly bind a demon so that they could dig up the treasure. I mean, that, this, this kind of thing of a talking salamander was, was not something unusual. Um, I, mean, I agree, you, and not just with Joseph Smith, uh, but you're right. Uh, the affidavits against him, uh, which the church people regard as scurrilous and biased and anti-Mormon, were often done by very respected, you know, normal people of that time period who were very bothered by what was going on in their area. Uh, but a lot of other people were doing the same kind of thing. There were other people using uh, white magic and various kind of uh, incantations to uh, try to find buried Spanish treasure or Mayan or you know a Native American treasure in these mounds and so forth. So yes, uh, there were complaints about that. Joseph Smith was actually arrested and brought to trial some 26 times for various um, uh, frauds or uh, illegal activities. Uh, so. He was uh, constantly having to deal with uh, the dissatisfaction of, of his, his neighbors in all kinds of ways, this being just one of them. So how was, how was Hoffman eventually called? You alluded to Throckmorton and uh, Flynn. Uh, Flynn, who found alligator in the, in the ink. But what, what sort of brought the, the bombings to, to pass? Well, the third bomb, uh, which exploded in his own car. He had a, a bomb that had a, a little glass tube with mercury, and if the mercury flipped from one side to the other, it would make a contact, and that would explode the bomb. And he parked his car on a hill over by the desert gym and either bumped the steering wheel or tipped it the wrong way because it was on an angle, and he, he bombed himself. But his car door was open, so it blew him out into the street, and he was pretty badly injured, but, but obviously not fatally. So that brought attention to him. And he passed a polygraph test, which is, uh, there are four different ways of, of determining if a person's telling the truth, respiration, perspiration, et cetera. He passed that. So for a while, there was doubt that he actually was a, a valid suspect. But then they decided to uh, look at his documents. And Throckmorton was a local examiner, and Flynn, uh, an examiner from uh, uh, Arizona. And they started uh, putting the documents under microscope, and they found that the ink uh, had a, a surface that li uh, like alligator skin, cracked. Uh, Hoffman was smart enough to use what they call galatonic ink. It's an it's, uh, ancient ink formula made from acorns of oak trees. And so he used authentic 19th century ink, but he had to figure out a way to age it because over time this dark, black, purple ink would turn sepia color, and he needed to figure that out. So initially, he used a hand iron. In one of his documents, you can actually see the point of the iron with the steam holes in the bottom. And, uh, and then he found out that if you use common household ammonia and apply that to the surface of the galatonic ink, it almost instantly turns it to sepia color and makes the document look 150 years old. The problem with that is it, it, that ammonia cracks the surface of the ink more so than a document that has the ink change color gradually. So that was the key thing. And then once they found that problem, they noticed some other problems too. Uh, he'd often get paper from the right year by stealing it out of books like the Grandin contract is printed on an 1829 piece of paper from Palmyra with a Palmyra uh, uh, watermark on it. He, you know, So he got the paper right and several other things right. But sometimes the edges would be cut with scissors. Sometimes he'd have a postmaster uh, that wasn't there that year. He was there three years later. Uh, sometimes he'd get uh, other little details wrong. The um, Oath of a Freeman has 
uh, it was a printed document, but the J's, the D centers, and the, like the H's, the A centers overlap so that uh, a, print, a printing process they had back there wouldn't have a centers and D centers overlapping in the same line because they printed the typeset was each line separately. So he made some other mistakes too. Uh, so one of the fascinating days was when uh, the two uh, forgery detectors went to the church office building and they asked to see a group of authentic uh, church documents, historical documents. And so the church brought out a whole stack of documents and the guys went through them and at the end of the day they had one little pile uh, over here which they said were forgeries and another stack which are authentic documents and the church people said, oh no, all, all of these are authentic documents, none of these are forgeries. And Throckmorton and Flynn said, well, no, these have the alligator in ink. Check the provenance. And they did. And they found out that each one of those documents which they had purchased had come through the hands of Mark Hoffman at some time or other. And so that became the, the litmus test uh, or, or the way of uh, detecting his documents and distinguishing them from authentic documents. I want to flesh this out a little more, but I want to go ahead and open up our phone lines. If you would like to join in the conversation, uh, we have Mr. Alan Roberts, the author of Salamander. Co-author, uh, actually. Co-author, I'm sorry. Co-author uh, co with uh, Linda Silito, who you said has just, just passed away. Um, I'll ask you about, more about that in a moment. But um, if you'd like to join in the conversation, the phone number here is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. And I apologize. I, I, um, I uh, forgot Miss Silito there. Um, can you tell us a little bit about her? Because you said she, that she had just passed away. Right. Uh, Linda and I traded a lot of information right after the bombings occurred. She was writing about it for the Desert News, and I was getting a lot of calls about it. I was involved with uh, Dialogue, the, the Mormon intellectual journal at that time. A lot of people were calling me for information. So every day we'd trade information. Then I got a call from Signature Books asking if, if I'd write a book on this because I had written the first uh, major article for Utah Holiday on this story. And I said, well, I'm a practicing architect. I, I can't really take all the time off it takes to write a book like this. And they said, find a co-author. So I asked a few writer friends of mine, and they all turned me down. And uh, Linda did, too, because she was really full-time employed at the Desert News. But then she uh, was taken off the story. She was very unhappy about that because uh, she thought she was doing a very accurate job. But the news needed to spin it a certain way. And she uh, is a difficult one to talk into doing something other than the truth as, as she understands it. So she quit the news and said, I'll, I'll co-author. So we had an 18-month contract to do the book, and it ended up going 27 months because the, the story just kept getting bigger and bigger and more and more documents. And, and uh, it took that long for it to go through the legal process. And finally, the book was published in 1988. And it's gone through several editions, maybe six editions, and three different format changes. And even two years ago, they reprinted it again under a different cover, six by nine format. There's also a smaller paperback edition. So uh, uh, she uh, passed away a month or so ago and uh, has had a couple of memorial services. And I, I spoke at the last one at the Sunstone Symposium uh, held here in August. Now, I'm curious about the um, the ideas salamander was not the the ultimate goal for for Hoffman was it I mean it it seems as if a lot of his materials towards the latter period were were centering around around Martin Harris doesn't it um, a lot of his documents were signed by Martin Harris and there weren't a lot of examples of Martin Harris's handwriting and so he was a good one to pick. Uh, he also forged Thomas Bullock and, and several other people, Brigham Young, Joseph Smith. In fact, his first Joseph Smith forgeries were so clumsy that people like Dean Jesse uh, didn't identify those as Joseph Smith documents. And, uh, but Hoffman wasn't implicated because he said, well, I just found this. I didn't know what it was. He didn't, didn't make a lot of claims for the early documents, so he wasn't under s suspicion. But he then uh, studied under a handwriting uh, specialist, a person who, who could teach 19th century calligraphy. And he perfected his ability to copy the handwriting styles of uh, various Mormon scribes. But uh, now Martin Harris's documents and the Salamander letter in particular were not the end goal. I think the end goal was to continue to make money, to continue to kind of 
play both ends, embarrass the church on the one side and, and take its money on the other side. We think he was preparing uh, some of the lost 116 plates of the Book of Mormon. The police found in his uh, studio down in his basement, which he kept locked, by the way, so his wife and kids couldn't get to it or anybody else. They found some drafts of uh, some pages they think were, were going to be prepared as some of the lost 116 pages, which have, would have had an incredible uh, commercial value. And he probably would have sold them off a page at a time. And one of the drafts had Lehi being a, a money digger and a treasure seeker and kind of in the mold of Joseph Smith. And so that would have actually cast more uh, a doubt about the, the Book of Mormon and its content. For those who aren't familiar <clears throat> with the development of the Book of Mormon, what are these missing 116 pages? Well, Joseph Smith uh, said he found the gold plates. He was directed to where they were, and he recovered them. And, and then he, he translated them uh, using various means, and uh, he wrote uh, the first uh, draft, uh, the first 116 pages, that, that draft, uh, and Martin Harris's wife was unhappy about his being gone all the time and helping Joseph Smith with various things, and Martin Harris said, well, this Book of Mormon is really important, and, and she said, well, if it's so important, I, I need some evidence of what's going on. I need to see some, something tangible. So Joseph Smith was asked by Harris to uh, lend him these pages, and Joseph Smith was very reluctant to do so. And eventually he succumbed to the pressure of Harris and his, and his wife and lent the pages, and then, uh, and then they disappeared, and they've never been found since. So people have been very interested in finding them because they'd like to compare the content of those pages with the first hundred and, you know, the first printed pages that came out in 1830 in the actual Book of Mormon to see if there are any differences. In other words, did he uh, trans re retranslate them and was the content identical to the first set, in which case it gives credit to the idea of translation? Or was he making it up and were the first pages different than the second set of pages covering the same content? And uh, nobody ever knows. So I think Kaufman basically would have come up with pages that were not in the Book of Mormon lending credence to the idea that Joseph made it up. According to the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, with the loss of the first 116 pages, God was uh, angry with Joseph and forbade him to, to retranslate those same pages and could only do a summary version of, of that. Um, Correct. That's how Joseph Smith covered himself under the possibility that they could show up again and somebody could say, hey, those are different. <laughs> what did you do? He, he, he had a way out, yeah. Now, the Salamander letter was not purchased directly by the LDS Church, but it ended up in their, in their control. How, how did that happen, and what do you see as some of the implications for how they handled the letter before it was found to be a forgery? Some of the documents Hoffman would sell to the church directly. And sometimes he would work through the church historians, uh, Don Olson and some of those people. And then the documents, had, had, they would have a price, and the price kept getting higher. And we're talking initially his documents were hundreds of dollars, and then a few thousand dollars, and then you know, twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000, and then later much bigger than that. And so the historians would check them out, and then they would make recommendations to church leaders, and, and church leaders would approve. Sometimes he worked directly with church leaders like Hinckley. And um, uh, there was an interesting press conference uh, after the murders in which people came and asked church PR people about some of these documents that church leaders had bought directly without them being announced. And I remember the church PR guy, uh, who, who I won't name, but he, he basically uh, said, I don't know and I'm not going to find out. <laughs> Be, uh, because uh, President Hinckley had obtained one of the key documents. I think it was the Josiah Stoll document directly and hadn't told the PR people. And so they had been contradicted earlier. But sometimes he would sell them to an individual church member and then the church member would donate them to the church as a, as a donation. And so he had different means of getting documents uh, into the hands of the church. Uh, people like Brent Ashworth, a major collector of, of Mormon Americana, would purchase documents, for example, and, and then a person like Brent would, would then deal with the church directly, so Hoffman didn't have to deal with them directly. The church leaders and, and uh, historians didn't really like dealing with Hoffman very much. He was a kind of a cagey dealer, 
and um, uh, a lot of his problems, frankly, were with his business practices, uh, which which very few people respected. So the the church. Uh, was given the the salamander letter. They believed it to be true, and it, it created some confusion within the ranks, didn't it? Uh, letters were sent out to uh, the the seminary teachers and things like this to about how to handle that among the um, among the, the the general membership. Yes, <laughs> I mean, what what did they? What was their response to the letter? Basically, I don't. I don't know that I can speak in behalf of the members or the church leaders other than um, I, I think they wanted to put the best spin on it they could so that church leaders wouldn't stop believing in the church based on this document. And so I think the emphasis was on putting your faith in the leaders and on your testimony and the uh, Holy Ghost and things that you've been taught your whole life. and church education system and so forth, and not, not to make faith based on a document. But it's a tricky, it's a slippery slope because uh, in testimony meetings, people get up and say, I know the Book of Mormon is true. They, they talk about their knowledge of the truth of historical facts and historical documents, and that Joseph Smith saw an angel and you know all of that. So Mormon church faith and history are indelibly connected, and it's hard to separate them out. And uh, I don't know that it was really very successful. I know it bothered some people significantly, and other people uh, weren't bothered by it at all. There was no document that could change their faith or, or destroy their testimony. As an outsider, it's striking to me that when the uh, Book of Abraham papyri were rediscovered back in the 60s, that one of the small things that's not often brought up, but just as an outsider, the LDS prophet claims to be able to interpret ancient text, and yet they they had to um, wait for for Hugh Nibley to to learn to read hieroglyphics. Uh, there's also the claim that with the LDS prophet that he's the discerner of on uh, things like this, right? I mean, right. You you brought up two problems. The latter one is how, how could Hoffman be successful in selling forgeries to church leaders, including church presidents, if they had the power to discernment? Why didn't, they, why didn't God tell them that, that this guy was a fraud and these documents were, were forgeries? And of course, that didn't happen. And so some people were unhappy about that. But the other problem is significant. Uh, most people don't know the Book of Mormon, or the uh, Book of Abraham difficulty. But it is, as you said, the uh, Joseph Smith obtained from uh, Anthony Labolo and Michael Chandler some papyrus from Egypt, and they were they were written on with uh, uh, hieroglyphics and some uh, graphic pictures. And Joseph Smith claimed to have translated those, like he did the Book of Mormon plates, and the content became in part the Book of Abraham, and it says that, you know, I, Abraham, am writing this. And, uh, and uh, then later in the 60s, Professor Aziz of the U of U uh, discovered the parchments. They were used as backing uh, upon which the drawings of the Independence Temple uh, were, were glued. And so now they show up again. It's kind of like the 116 pages showing up again, or, or the Book of Mormon plates showing up again. And so now, uh, with Egyptologists who could read Egyptian, uh, they were vulnerable to, to actual uh, translation. So Ed Ashman uh, spoke at one of the early Sunstone Symposia uh, about this, and he showed that the, the papyrus that Joseph Smith translated, in fact, had nothing to do with Abraham. There was no Book of Abraham in those documents. They were Book of the Breathings and Book of the Dead, which are two common Egyptian books. And so, uh, basically, the conclusion is Joseph Smith made up the entire Book of Abraham, and the documents that he translated had no relationship to that whatsoever. So that was presented. Hugh Nibley actually responded at that symposium, and he had been the Book of Abraham expert up to that point, and uh, really couldn't say much about it. He, he couldn't defend his position. In fact, he said, I'm not responsible for anything I wrote more than three years ago. And he, he just had to kind of back away and admit that 
uh, Ashman and others had had more advanced scholarship and ability to read the documents and uh, then later he reneged a little and tried tried to muster up a, a defense but uh, I think that's one problem that no one in the church has been able to solve successfully and the Kinderhook plates are similar to that where Joseph Smith translated these eight bell-shaped plates that were found in a mound in Kinderhook, New York and then after uh, purporting to translate them uh, the the two men who were uh, blacksmiths who had made the plates came forward and said hey we made these plates and we, we created them and used you know cattle brands and etched them with an awl and they're just pieces of copper and we acidized them to look old and, you know but these these plates aren't ancient at all we made them and therefore you're not a true translator you're not a true prophet uh, but you don't learn about that in seminary or, or anywhere <clears throat> Now, before the Salamander Letter was determined to be a forgery, farms uh, had already come into existence, the Foundation for Ancient Research, Research in Mormon Studies. Um, they, were, they were at the forefront of trying to reconcile the Salamander Letter with, with what the church was currently teaching, weren't they? I think the purpose of farms is to use uh, scholastic scholarly means, uh, you know, academic scholarship, research, etc., to try to prove uh, the truth claims of the church to, to be, you know, valid. And so you have a lot of PhDs, you have archaeologists and textual critics and scriptural experts and so forth, all, all charged with that mission. That's what they do. Um, but I, I think people who are not part of farms have, have always um, held their work in some disregard because of the overriding mission, which is to protect the faith and uh, y you know use farms as, as a vehicle to do that, rather than to seek the truth wherever it might lie. And so, yes, that I think that was part of their mission, and their, their blogs and their publications and so forth have come out to try to discredit everything Hoffman did. And of course, when they're forgeries, you can say, see, the Salamander letter wasn't authentic. It was a forgery, and he was an anti-Mormon try to destroy the church, and therefore we can dismiss him and everything associated with him. But the fact is that most of his documents were based on actual Mormon history, and uh, uh, he added some speculative elements that weren't, and, and, and so you can attack those, but you can't, you can't attack everything. It, it seems to be a, a common course that Sometimes the, the, the critics of the LDS Church provide the, the, the rope for their own hanging to some extent. Uh, you know, you have people who will <clears throat> make very true claims, but then they are desperate to find some other um, more, out, more uh, convicting accusation. And so they, they reach for things that are not able to be substantiated or may not have any basis, in fact, whatsoever. And then they just lump, the, the guys at farms seem to lump everything together and dismiss everything rather than, than uh, actually dealing with the more substantial criticisms. Um, I want to go ahead and open Thanks up. Thanks for not making me comment on that <laughs> <laughs> because I don't really want to, uh, you know, have an anti Mormon diatribe. I think that the internet is uh, going to play out in an interesting way more people have more access to more information. So people that are seeking to know the details of Mormon history or theology or uh, you know, scriptural claims, everything like that, they'll, they'll have more access to more information. And uh, defenders of the faith will use it to you know, promote, promote uh, the church as well. So uh, the electronic age, I think, is actually changing things as well. I want to flesh that out a little bit more, but um, it's a little bit of a different conversation tonight. And I would like to open the phone lines one more time. If you'd like to join in the conversation, the phone number here is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. Now you yourself, um, you know, I'm treading lightly here, but, but you have personally been very involved in some of the, the in, intellectual uh, explorations from within the LDS community, haven't you? As far as you mentioned di uh, dialogue, uh, you, you wrote more than just an article for dialogue. You, you were much more involved in, in that, weren't you? Uh, my first involvement was uh, writing about church architecture for publications like the Utah Historical Quarterly. 
And then I became involved with the first group of uh, uh, people that produced Sunstone. The first article in Sunstone, volume one, number one, is an uh, article I did on stained glass windows in Mormon churches. Um, and so I was part of the uh, original founding group of Sunstone and was with that group for quite a while. I was actually the publisher and the co-editor with Peggy Fletcher. Uh, then after the Sunstone period, I was uh, one of the associate editors of Dialogue, the Journal of Mormon Thought, for six years. And then in the um, 90s, uh, early 90s, I was uh, co-editor, co-publisher with Martha uh, Bradley of Dialogue, and so I was involved with that for quite a while, and then I served on the board for quite a while. Uh, I was on the board of Signature Books for over a decade, and one of the, uh, <clears throat> uh, on the editorial team of the Journal of Mormon History as well. Uh, that's a journal that comes out uh, quarterly. So um, yes, the answer is yes. For 30 some years, I spent a lot of my time publishing, editing, writing, uh, working with uh, authors on their articles, raising funds uh, for these publications, uh, and so forth. So. Is Dialogue still publishing? It's, it's been a while since I've yes. seen it. Uh, yeah, it was founded in California in 1965, and I think the first edition came out in 66. So it's been around since 66, and Sunstone got its start 10 years later, 75, 76. I think volume one, number one, was 1976. And both of them are still publishing regularly. They're solid. Um, and uh, many other publications have come about since that time and have come and have gone. But these two seem to have some staying power. As people within the LDS <clears throat> church are becoming more aware of the outside world, becoming more aware of their history, becoming more aware of counterclaims, what do you see happening? I mean, the, the, these are more for the, 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 the of scholarly interest within the LDS uh, community. I mean, there are people that, at a popular level, there doesn't seem to be as much interest in these things. But with signature books and things like this, it seems like people are really examining their roots. Do the claims hold up? Things like this. What do you see happening within the LDS community in general? I mean, is that, is that ferment among the people who are reading things from signature books, reading dialogues, uh, coming to the Sunstone conferences? Do you see that working its way through the community at large? Um, what kind of reception have the, the people who've been involved in these things received from within the LDS church uh, community. I mean, are there Frankly, these, these publications, I think, have very minimal impact on the church and very minimal influence within the hierarchy. Some, but not a lot. I think we'd like to think and hope otherwise. And I think the reason we publish these things, and, and they're not anti-Mormon vehicles. They're, they're Mormon study vehicles. They attempt to uh, uh, analyze and, and discuss uh, all aspects of church history, politics, uh, social life, um, theology, you know, the fiction and poetry and everything. So, so uh, we shouldn't misunderstand their intent or their mission. But Dialogue has a few thousand subscribers, and Sunstone has a few thousand subscribers, and the Journal of Mormon History, you know, maybe a thousand or less, and Signature Books publishes a lot of books, and there are several thousand readers. But when you add up all of those people together, and then you look at the symposium, now the symposium is one of the biggest religious sym sym symposium in the, in the country, and it's held in places other than Salt Lake. It's held all over the country. But even so, you add those numbers in, and we're talking about .000, one, three, or so. I mean, it's a very small percentage of the church membership. Uh, probably more people read those publications than those, you know, maybe 20,000 people that I just mentioned. But I think most Mormons are unaware of Sunstone Dialogue and the symposium entirely. And those who are aware have some vague notion of it, and very few people have participated. I think the people that are bothered by these these conflicts, these contradictions, uh, are the educated Mormons who are deeply interested in their faith. 
and their tradition and their history and uh, their, their, their whole belief system. I think those people tend to examine more deeply and if they are true seekers and not just um, <clears throat> entirely biased in one direction, then they'll discover things and many of them stay in the church anyway because of the spiritual values, the social values. Uh, not all people will leave just because they find some historical anomalies that are difficult to swallow. As an outsider, I've seen great changes in Mormonism just in my lifetime. Uh, it seems as if the, the, the LDS that I used to know were much more um, clearly separating themselves from the rest of the visible church. That they were, they were saying that they were the only true church. And there seemed to be a bit of a, more of a militancy among some of them, not all, but, but some. Now that the church has shifted, I mean, in my lifetime, um, the uh, blacks have been admitted to the priesthood after a lot of discussion prior to that. And now I'm seeing this move towards at least a language of universalism that we're Christians too. And there's a desire to be accepted within the larger Christian community, and yet there's still the old line that they are, that, that all the other churches are wrong, all their professors are corrupt, all their creeds are an abomination, and yet there's this almost uh, schizophrenia to an outsider. And I'm wondering if, if Mormonism is getting ready to change yet again. I mean, we've seen changes in terms of um, the changes just in the early period, but then after they come to Utah, there seems to be the throwing off of the, the idea of the imminent return of Christ, more of a peace with the outside world. There seems to, uh, you know, there's of course the change with polygamy, blacks in the priesthood. You, you have seen these uh, at, at much closer range than I have. Do you see potential other changes coming down the pike? The astute religious observer Martin Marty once said that religions that uh, succeed and flourish make very few changes and they make them very slowly. And I think that's been the pattern for the LDS Church. Uh, they want to convert people and it's not a popular conversion tactic to walk in and the first thing you say is your church is false and ours is true and you know you've got to change your whole way of thinking. The missionary discussions have changed. Uh, the approach has changed. You've had some kinder, gentler church leaders, David O. McKay, Spencer W. Kimball, Gordon Hinckley, for example, who are not uh, doctrinaire. Uh, they're not going to emphasize <clears throat> those, those problematic points. Uh, even the temple ceremony has changed somewhat. The church has a lot of uh, people doing studies all the time and they're, they're surveying opinions, uh, how they're perceived by non-Mormons, uh, certain kinds of non-Mormons, uh, 13 million, 13 and a half million people, that's the current membership, six million in the United States. So over half the people are now speaking in foreign tongues and living in foreign countries. So they're trying to um, design a message that appeals to those people. And so it's not the same message as appealed to people in Liverpool, England in, in you know, 1840, or that appeal to uh, you know, people in the 1870s or the 1920s. So the church does want to be perceived as a mainstream Christian church. And they're, they're very bothered by attempts to define them as non-Christian. So they've added uh, that they've changed the title of the Book of Mormon, you know, the Book of Mormon and the New Testimony of Jesus Christ. And in the Mormon meeting houses where they have the name of the church on the front, they've made the words Jesus Christ bigger and the, and the Latter-day Saints smaller. And so I think there's a concerted effort to project an image of, of being very Christian. And yet on the books are still all of these other things that you referred yeah. to and nobody's um, erased those or, or invalidated them. They're still there, but they don't emphasize them anymore. The emphasis, the, the church uh, messages on TV are very uh, warm-hearted, they're very Christ-centered. They, they, I don't think anybody can have any argument with any of those messages, and that's how they want to portray themselves. And really, when you know the people, most of the people are like that, too. I, as a confessional Presbyterian, um, 
I don't think that we would have liked to hang out with each other, but I can I can get my mind around Bruce McConkey easier than I can get my my mind around um, some of the the other more modern things that I hear coming out of the church in terms of he he drew distinct lines. He 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 seemed to have a very clear image, and now it seems as if you're trying to nail Jello to a tree in terms of trying to get clear doctrinal statements on some of these things. But well, I think the church is saying the important things aren't doctrinal anymore. Yeah. They're how you treat your neighbor. They're the Beatitudes. They're Christ-like living. They're, they're not how many angels are on, on the head of the pin or whether this interpretation of a verse in the New Testament is more accurate or valid than another. That's not where they want to go anymore. I mean, McConkie uh, did draw lines in the sand, a deep, deep <laughs> lines, and they were very clear. And oh, the yeah. church leaders themselves were uncomfortable with his book. And uh, they had him change things in the book, and they weren't happy about republishing the book, and they weren't happy about the cult that surrounded the Book Mormon doctrine. And uh, they would like to distance themselves from him in that period in that book. And if you look at the literature that comes out of the church now, uh, both for members and the, the ma lesson manuals for Sunday school classes, for example, uh, are very different than they were, say, 50 years ago. And the, doc the messages they give to potential converts are very different, too. I want to come back to that, but I want to squeeze in one call before we end here. Uh, we have Galen from Salt Lake. Good to have you with us this evening. Galen? Um, I would like to ask your guest, uh, will he give a quick his overall assessment of Joseph Smith? What does he think about him? Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Galen. That's a very interesting question. He was a, a very complicated man and a very intelligent man, and I would say that in some ways he could be regarded as the uh, as similar to the other uh, prophets in other religious traditions. That is, I think he wanted to elevate his people to a higher level of spirituality and religious practice. Uh, he emphasized community. Uh, he uh, was sort of a shamanistic person. Uh, he d developed scripture that represented the, the points of view that he wanted people to adhere to. Uh, and so you can compare him to people like Ellen White and Mary Baker Eddy and even uh, earlier people, you know, Martin Luther. He was trying to reform Christianity like Luther was trying to reform Catholicism and maybe even compare him to some of the, uh, you know, Old and New Testament prophets. Uh, he created wisdom literature that, um, so I'm, I'm coming at it from a, a sort of a secular humanist point of view rather than from a, a denominational uh, believer point of view. He had a lot of problems. Uh, I think the whole issue of, of polygamy and the deception that it entailed, and uh, even just before his death, he, he admitted that he was deceived on the issue of polygamy. Uh, he, he did some, some really questionable things, uh, but he, he aroused uh, a certain uh, strong, zealous belief in his followers. People loved him or they hated him. Uh, it's interesting that 60, 60 some percent of his original uh, group of general authorities he either disfellowshipped or excommunicated, uh, uh, showing that it was hard to even be close to him. A lot of his close, closest followers, like William Law, you know, left him um, because of his personal flaws. Um, but, um, you know, I, I leave it to individuals to decide for themselves what value they can get out of his life and, and the legacy that he left. Some people find it immensely value, valuable. Other f people think he was a charlatan and a fraud, or as uh, I think Dan Vogel said, a pious fraud. I mean, there are a lot of models. Uh, Jan Ships has a model, and, uh, every, you know, there, there are probably a dozen models out, out there that try to describe who Joseph Smith was. And um, I think I'll stop there. I, I could talk about the psychoanalysis that's been done by, Jesh, uh, by, by a number of people as well. Uh, but I, I think he actually fits in with, uh, as, as a founding father of many religious traditions, many of the others have very similar characteristics to his. Now, obviously, as, a, as an Orthodox Presbyterian, you and I are coming <clears throat> from different perspectives on that. but. Uh, I appreciate the, the scholarship that you've shown in this and, and the other uh, works that you've been involved with and with signature books. 
If someone would like to buy a copy of this, uh, you said that it's still in print, and so uh, right. how Th could this someone This is get the a first edition, and the one on the screen is the paperback version, and there's a new version with a different cover that came out about two years ago. You can buy it at places like Sam Weller's. You can get it through Benchmark Books, Kurt Bench has it, you can go directly to okay. Signature Books and buy it. It's, it's still available. Well, Mr. Roberts, thank you so much for being with us this evening. It was a great privilege. Thank you for inviting me. Our show is sponsored by Christ Presbyterian Church. If you would like more information on us, we invite you to go to our website, ChristPres.net, or to the uh, TV show website, AncientPaz.tv. We meet Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. and Sunday evenings at 5.30 p.m. at 8630 West, 2700 South. That's Main Street Magna. We are a congregation of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Uh, we believe the Bible is our only infallible rule of faith and practice, that we are all sinners saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Uh, if you would like more information, you can go to the website or give us a call at 801-969-7948 would also like to invite you to visit with our sister congregation in Ogden, uh, Berean Presbyterian Church. They meet Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. at 3350 Harrison Boulevard. Uh, they rent from the United Church of Christ there. And it's a new congregation. The Lord's been blessing a great deal there. And we also have a Bible study in American Fork that meets Sunday afternoons at 430 in the Senior Center there in downtown American Fork. They're going through the Westminster Confession of Faith, and we invite you to come and join us. Well, we hope to see you next week. We'll have Charles Larson, the author of By His Own Hand Upon Papyrus. Until then, we wish you the Lord's greatest blessings. Good night.